Welcome to Human Potential at Work, the show where we explore social impact, inclusion, and empowerment of everyone, including persons with disabilities. Get ready to be inspired, hear success stories, and learn tips and principles for bringing out the best in everyone. Hello, everyone. This is Deborah Rue, and this is Human Potential at Work. Today, we are going to continue our conversation on, about employing people with disabilities. And um, the organization that I invited to the show is an organization that's been very, very helpful to my family. And it is The Arc. And um, we, have, we have Jonathan and we have Stefan, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves to you. But I will tell you, as most of you know, I have a daughter that's 31 years old that has Down syndrome. And we have you know, been helped by a lot of it, you know, nonprofits over the years as a family, but no organization has helped us more than the ARC. They recently, as my daughter, many of you knew, was very, very ill and in the hospital. Um, the ARC of Virginia actually helped me as I was trying to get my daughter support with a Medicaid waiver. And you wouldn't think of the ARC as doing something like that, but they always are doing things for the, our community and really supporting us in a lot of different ways. And um, I'm a big fan because they've always been there for my family. And so um, some of you might recognize Stéphane, Stéphane Lebois, who I am messing that last name up because he was a former guest. And I recommend you go back and listen to that show because he was talking about um, we were really talking about it from the perspective of millennials and how they're getting really engaged in making the world a better place. And it was a very popular episode. So we will make sure that when we, um, when we market the episode and we put it out on the website, we provide that link. But some of you might re remember him from past episodes. It's been a couple of years ago. But um, Jonathan and Stefan, welcome to the show today. Thanks for having us. So Jonathan, why don't we start with you? Why don't you give an introduction about who you are and what you're doing, and then we'll turn it over to Stefan. Definitely. So I'm Jonathan Lucas. I'm the Senior Director here at the ARC of the United States, and I oversee our national social enterprise called the ARC at Work, which supports companies around the country um, hiring and retain people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in their workforces. Um, I also have the pleasure of overseeing the ARC of DC, which is one of our local chapters um, it provides an array of services to people with disabilities in the District of Columbia. Uh, and my name is Stefan Lebois. Um, I am the program manager for the ARC at Work. Um, and so Jonathan and I are kind of the, the two person team here um, at the ARC's national office. Um, and so I'm kind of in the uh, the engine room of the of the program, um, and I manage the multiple different activities that we'll talk about later. Um, uh, as well as service one of the primary points of contact for our um, corporate uh, clients. So. so let's talk a little bit about what the ARC is, because I obviously, as I've said, <clears throat> my family has worked um, with the ARC a long time. And, I've, you know, I, but I know that the ARC has been around a long time and it is certainly a U.S. nonprofit. But um, tell us more about what the ARC is. Yeah. The ARC is the oldest and largest organization serving people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the United States. It's been around, what, 65 years or so, getting close to 70 now. And uh, we have 650 chapters across the country that provide an array of services from employment to integration in society to uh, support with medical issues, schooling. Uh, we do a lot of advocacy, both at the state level and the federal level. And our goal is to support people from birth to death. Yeah, and and that you you know you bring up a good point because one thing that I love about the ARC is that you're in the local communities. So I am in Virginia, and we have been working with the Hanover ARC, which is a county in my where the county where I live, and they they are always doing stuff to support our family. They they have parties, they have social events, they have education events. They're they, we have days going to the Capitol where we're going to talk about our rights and, you know, get, get rid of the, the waiting lists and all the different things, the advocacy things. And then also Virginia, we're, you know, we are very supportive and part of the Virginia ARC. And then you have the national. So 
when we're talking about including people with disabilities, I talk a lot and I say this in my books and stuff, you have to look at it from a multi-pronged approach. You have to go to local. You have to look at it from national. And a lot of times you have to look at it from global, especially if you're a multinational corporation or organization. And so one thing that I love about the ARC is that you do have all these chapters. So you actually are part of our communities. And I think, you know, that... I think that we can do a better job of really tapping into those 650 local chapters. Um, and so I think that's exciting. And I know right before we went on air, I was talking to you about the global aspect, because once again, I know you're, you know, one of the largest U.S. nonprofits supporting people with intellectual develop and developmental disabilities. But You've also, you also work globally. So do you mind, you know, talking about that a little bit? And, and Jonathan mentioned the past that you had mentioned um, what y'all had done in the past as well with Cuba. Yeah, certainly. So, uh, you know, we, we, it's also a multiple prong um, process of trying to get our expertise out um, in a global perspective. Uh, one of the things we do on an annual basis, we host delegations from around the world who comprise of governmental entities and people from NGOs and explain to them how the disability uh, support world works here in the U.S., how the art plays a key role in that, and um, help them develop approaches they can take back to their home countries and implement. Um, I've had the opportunity to do that for uh, countries such as China. We've had uh, South Korea in here. We've had delegations from almost every continent. Uh, we also work, as Stefan was saying earlier, with Inclusion International, which is the international and international body of uh, diversity uh, and disability groups from around the world. And so every couple of years, we hold a joint conference uh, together where they're coming in, they're doing uh, their meetings, we're having our meetings, and then we have some joint sessions where we're learning from each other, which is very key. And then lastly, which I'll talk about later, is um, I was part of a delegation um, through the State Department to Egypt and uh, helped both the parliament there in their policies, but also large NGOs around the country um, develop more sustainable programs. Yes, I've been blessed to go to Egypt multiple times and I've worked with them. Um, as a matter of fact, Stefan's father, XL Lagois, who is an amazing leader, um, I went over there with G3ICT and we were doing a lot of uh, policy work and making sure that the policies were in place so that the corporations could successfully employ people with disabilities over there. So there's been some really amazing work that I think we've all done um, over in Egypt and I, you know, the work continues. So the, we have 86 countries that watch the pro, watch or listen to the program. So um, if there's anybody out there that isn't involved in making sure that people with intellectual disabilities or cognitive disabilities are being included. These two gentlemen are experts. So, you know, definitely make sure that you can reach out to them and, um, and learn from what they're doing. So speaking of what you're doing, so let's, let, let's drive in a little bit more into that. And um, so and I don't know if I should throw this question to you, uh, but I'm going to just do it this way, Stefan. What does inclusive employment mean? Well, um, so, you know, I'm kind of speaking to an inclusion guru, um, so, you know, I, I, won't, I won't bore you too much, but, you know, from the uh, employment lens, um, I actually, uh, I'm going to take a page out of uh, an HR professional and um, author, Jennifer Brown, wrote a, a, a terrific book on this. Um, and, you know, she recently had an interview with Forbes where she said the following, diversity is the who and the what. So who's sitting around the table? who's being recruited, who's being promoted, who's being, uh, who we're tracking from the traditional characteristics and identities of gender and ethnicity and sexual orientation and disability. Um, but inclusion, on the other hand, is really the how. Um, inclusion is the behaviors that welcome and embrace diversity. So if you're a great leader um, for inclusion, you figured out how to embrace and galvanize di uh, diversity of voices and identities. And I think that's kind of, you know, what we try to do um, here at the ARC is, is, is not only, uh, you know, help individuals with disabilities get into jobs, but on the other end, work with workplaces to create a truly inclusive workplace. So it's a, you know, an, and a, true, a truly inclusive workplace is a place that allows employees of all races, you know, sexual orientation, disability, you know, uh, work on the same plane as their peers. 
Um, you know, and so when one of our corporate partners asks us to, you know, for support in creating a disability inclusive hiring initiative, um, you know, we, we work on both ends. So we identify the right candidates and we, you know, we make sure that uh, uh, the right folks are being hired into the jobs. But again, on the other end, we're training frontline managers and, you know, and their, and their, uh, you know, and their workmates and, and leadership on how to create an environment that's going to allow them to thrive. Great answer. I do know Jennifer Brown. Uh, Jennifer Brown's uh, got, a, I love her book inclusion and I heard she has a second book coming out and she has a wonderful podcast that she does as well. And we actually share the same um, producer, Douglas uh, Foresta. And I had him first, but <laughs> then she actually <laughs> called and she said, Deborah, who are you using? And I uh, recommended Doug because he he's such a superstar. But um one thing that I was hearing, <clears throat> I've heard some complaints about, is that the community of people with intellectual disabilities, uh, we think it's wonderful, wonderful that people with autism are being included in, in the workforce. Wonderful. And I know that you have been engaged in some of those activities, so I'd like you to talk about that at some point. But I've also heard people complain from the Down syndrome community and other communities that we think it's wonderful that people with autism are being included, but we really want to include everybody, you know, everybody that has a developmental disability that wants to work, you know, not just one segment of the group. And so <clears throat> I know that that is one reason why you have the ARC at work. And um, I'm, you know, I, I was wondering, and I'll let y'all decide who wants to answer, answer this, but what role does the ARC at work um, have to play in the disability you know, ecosystem? And how do we make sure that we get even more people with autism employed, but we also make sure that the other members of the groups are uh, employed as well? Yeah, and I, that's a great question. And, and we definitely are in the space of supporting people on the autism spectrum as well. But the great thing about the ARC, we, we help people with over 60 different diagnoses. Um, at all points of their life and, and especially employment. So, you know, our goal is twofold. We need to strengthen that chapter network that we have to ensure that they have the proper tools, knowledge, and training to work with corporations in today's world uh, to meet their demands, understand where their pain points are, and place people in roles that will they'll ultimately be successful in, but also I think we'll all we'll, we'll recognize that return on investment for, for hiring those folks and the company will be successful. And we do that through a very um, scripted, uh, focused process that's tailored to each company in particular. So we don't uh, just have this broad way of doing things that we try to apply across the board. We really try to understand what the company's needs are. And that process starts with, we're doing always doing a chapter of training for people, um, whether it's in the IT field, food industry, you name it. We're making sure candidates who come through our doors locally are getting the skills, both hard skills and soft skills they need to succeed. Uh, while that's going on, they're being assessed. You know, what do they want to do um, as far as their vocational life? What skills do they bring to the table? And uh, at the same time, Stefan and I are working and talking to employers about their needs are, understanding the specifics of each job, and then we're doing candidate matching. So we're going to the local chapter where the hiring is taking place and saying, hey, this is exactly what we're looking for. Who do you have in your cadre that can fit this? And do they want this type of job? So once that happens, um, then we go through the candidate recruitment piece. We're also training the frontline managers and senior managers of these companies to communicate and work alongside people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in a very successful manner. So it's educating both sides of this equation and strengthening them. Once that takes place and they're onboarded, the new hires are onboarded, we uh, provide in-person training again, both to the new employee, but also to the frontline manager and ongoing job coaching support, at least up through the ni first 90 days to ensure that this new person is successful. The communication and dialogue are maintained with this hire and uh, the, their team and their managers. And you know, we, we wanna make this a very inclusive process very solid process at the end of the day, success, uh, successful and employers feel good about their decisions and that um, you know people are staying in their jobs. And we can boast uh, through our programs have a 98% retention rate. So, and I think that number comes from matching the right candidate with the right opportunity or providing that support throughout the process. Wow, that's very impressive. Do you wanna add anything to that, Stefan? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that um, I think that oftentimes um, uh, corporate clients and, and certainly uh, private, uh, a lot of private sector folks, even some public sector folks, are you know have um, have a misconception that um, nonprofit agencies like ours may not have the capacity or may, like may work a little bit slower, may have a different you know uh, like work ethic or what have you. Um, and you know what? What Jonathan and I try to do. First of all, our our, our chapters are terrific. Um, they're responsive. They're super hardworking. And what Jonathan and I try to do is kind of create a, a bridge of communication, certainly a bridge of capabilities between the two, um, b- between our clients and, and our chapters, so that you know that that relationship runs smoothly, and that you know expectations are you know clearly drawn and clearly met at the end of the day. Um, so we really treat. Um, kind of what we do in a very, you know, business-like, very uh, um, uh, official manner. And I think that um, a lot of folks, uh, again, we, we try to dispel the myth or the misconception that um, that nonprofits can't work this way. Yeah. Which is a really good point. Yeah, go ahead, Jonathan, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. I think our goal is to reduce, uh, reduce the risk, the perceived risk that I mean, employers see. I don't think there's a huge risk there, but a lot of times employers worry about that. So. We make sure the communication is um, continually going, and we problem solve for both the chapter and uh, and the employer who is hiring. And I, I think you're right. I think there there is a perceived risk. You know, the risk is I'm going to hire this person with a disability. They're not going to perform, and I'm not going to be able to let them go. And um, we all have been trying to break down those barriers. And I, I think it's an interesting point you brought up, Stefan, that there is definitely a misperception that uh, nonprofits don't, you know, they're not going to be able to work at the speed of corporations. And I know when I joined this, this field in 2001, we actually, that was actually true. There were a lot of the nonprofits were trying to respond to what was happening with the laws and supporting the corporations, but they just weren't really equipped to do that. Um, And so, but that isn't the case anymore. Um, I know that Stefan, when you joined the ARC, I was, you know, I, I was really impressed because I know what an impressive person you are. And then you introduced me to Jonathan and I started learning about what you're doing. And, um, and because we've had so many personal family experiences with the ARC in the different, you know, national, local, statewide, um, I, I felt like I, you know, I'd already benefited from a lot of the professionalism that you'd showed me. Um, let me ask another question. I'll let y'all decide how you who wants to answer it because you might both want to answer it. But what is your philosophy when working with a corporate client to create or improve a current inclusive employment initiative? Yeah, I think we need to help them understand how this is crucial for the bottom line, to the business, the business decision, and not frankly a a social one or you know. A, a, you know, it's great that we're, they're helping the community in a way that the part of the community that needs support and understanding. But in the day, it's about the benefits that people we serve bring to the table of these corporations. And so, in order for a business to be successful at this, they need to see that um, that's the key to the whole um, whole paradigm, and that uh, most of these need to move forward. One of the things that businesses often do in trying to mitigate some of that risk is want to take it very, very slowly. They want to you know, do a lot of internal investigation of their company, find the exact best perfect job, place somebody in, make sure they have everything in place. And all that's good and well, but in the, the day, uh, it doesn't matter if you don't move forward and actually do it. And nothing's perfect. So making mistakes is great. And it's okay. You know, it's, it's part of the process as long as you understand um, and learn from it. And our goal is to help companies who either doing this to some degree or getting ready to do this, um, begin the pilot phase of, especially when it comes to people with IDD, maybe they've hired people with sensory disabilities or other dis- physical disabilities, and now they want to jump into the realm of hiring people with, with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Our goal is to heck, how can we do this first in a small scale, but do it very well, and then expand once you feel comfortable with the process. And that's generally the, the protocol that we take. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I would say that um, you know we you know we've worked with a number of Fortune 500 companies. Um, actually, before my time, um, Jonathan uh, worked with one of our affiliates in um, in Philadelphia um, on a 
on a pilot project um, with SAP that um, where you know a couple of individuals um, on the autism spectrum in the occurrence um, were placed into jobs there. And since then, you know, again, they started small, very targeted approach, very um, uh, uh, mindful and purposeful approach. Um, and then over time, that project's ballooned. And now, you know, our um, uh, SAP and, and our affiliate in, in Philadelphia are, are doing wonderful things. Um, you know, and, and that's just one example of a couple of different clients that we've worked with um, on that level to really kind of expand their uh, their disability hiring. And again, as Jonathan was saying, it starts purposeful, it starts small. And, you know, once you get the small wins, you get the confidence, you get the standard operating procedures going, you start convincing, you know, the, the, the decision makers and the powers that be that, hey, you know what, this is a great idea. And let's, let's, you know, let's make this thing uh, uh, expand. Um, and so it's really about the small wins at the end of the day. Okay. One thing about SAP, going back to your question about our global impact, is um, it's a German-based company. They're global. They started in Germany. They came to the United States. They were very successful in the U.S. And guess what? They expanded to Brazil and China and, and uh, Australia. And so, you know, what we did in Philadelphia ultimately helped them um, have the ability to make make their program a, a global one. And I, um, I have to say a few things. First of all, you do not sound like you work for a nonprofit. You sound like you work for a corporation. Kudos. Number two, I love SAP. I was just on SAP radio and they, and they were taught because they're expanding into all kind of other things. They want to be fully inclusive. They want to be accessible. They've written a book about accessibility that printed years ago. And I'm really blessed. I'm going to be on SAP radio again on May 1st talking about this. And I'm on the radio with um, the, the host. Her name is Bonnie and the uh, their chief design officer. So they're saying, wow, how can we make sure our, our workforce is inclusive for everyone. So bravo to SAP. And I know that you've worked with other corporations as well. I know that we've talked about Ernst & Young and there's others and, and you give corporate awards. So you really, you really do a good job at supporting corporations. And once again, I think the I think our nonprofits have learned a lot walking these paths and they've learned how business works and they've learned, you know, what works uh, for a multinational like an SAP. And the, the beautiful story about SAP is that they inspired all these other corporations to follow the lead. I mean, Microsoft got involved and SAP, I mean, uh, Ernst & Young, I mentioned, and there's just so many activities and the corporations are learning from each other but working with, you know, partners. And that's one thing I like about what I hear with the ARC and the ARC at work is that you consider it a partnership. You're not going to say you have all the answers. You want to work with not only your local and national chapter, uh, local and state chapters, but you work with other providers mm -hmm. to make sure that, you know, the corporation's needs are met. And so I, I want to dig into d just some um, not negative stuff, but a little bit of negative stuff. So I remember as an employer, I've been employing people with disabilities for many years. I'm very, very proud to have people working for me that have disabilities and some very severe disabilities. And um, they, uh, the retention rates that you were missing, mentioning, Stefan, they're out. They're just amazing. Um, they're, you know, the first to work. It's just, uh, it's really amazing. But I remember um, years ago, I had a gentleman that worked for me that had autism. And he was great. He was doing a wonderful job. And then he just wasn't. And he started, um, something happened. And he started being very disruptive in the workplace. He actually started harassing one of the girls in the office. So then it became a sexually hostile work. And it was not something a small business owner or anybody else wants to deal with. And here I am a quote expert, which, you know, what does that even mean? Because the world is changing so fast, but it really scared me because yes, I could just fire this man, but I also have an obligation as the CEO of the company to make sure I am not creating that that there is not a hostile work environment or sexually hostile work environment. So what I did was I went to my partners. I went to my partners that had brought these employees to me and I said, well this is this 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 is happening and and I didn't come to them for about two weeks. I tried to handle it myself. 
And they said, Deborah, why did you even hesitate? Come to us right away. We can help you navigate these problems. So they stepped in and they navigated. And what it had turned out was the 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 man that was working for me, his roommate had talk, talked him out um, into going off of his medication. And he said, oh, it's going to make you feel funny. And but he just talked him to go off of it. And when he did go off of it, um, it caused this man to sort of start spiraling and cause problems at work. And um, so I didn't fire him. What we did was we worked on it. We got him, you know, back and every, every, we got everything working and well, but I couldn't do it by myself because I had a company I had to run. So I know that you support corporations of all sizes, including small businesses like me. And so that right there was invaluable. And then I'll tell you a story, um, a story that always bugs me. But um, my, my daughter, uh, Sarah worked for Nordstrom's for years, very, very successfully. She worked for them for 11 years. She had wonderful performance reviews. And yes, I'm such a nerd, I kept them. But, um, and then she got sick. So she's not working right now until she get, regains her health. But, um, and Stefan, thank you for being with me every step of the way during that. I really am grateful. Sorry, but thank you. Um, it, it's really hard when you're walking through that. And it's nice to have your friends to go, I'm so scared. So thank you, Stefan. But um, her friend started working at a movie theater. And he was um, a gentleman that um, had autism and low functioning, and he loved the movie theater. So he started working at the movie theater and um, his dream job. And then he would go on break and he would go into the movies and he would get engrossed in the movie and he wouldn't come out. And so the movie theater fired him. And I was like, <laughs> couldn't we have gotten, you know, like the ARC at work back in to support him or whoever his provider was? Because what I would have done instead of firing him, I would have said, when you're working, you aren't allowed to go to the movies. You have to go into the break room, but you can come in on your days off and watch all the movies you want for free because it's a benefit of working for the movie theater. But it always makes me sad when we see a sex a successful hire and then something goes wrong and we we react that way. And so I think working with for employers to work with partners like the ARC at work, it is not just about hiring people with disabilities, with intellectual disabilities. It's about retaining people as they live their lives. And, you know, some people, we all make mistakes at work sometimes. So I, I was just wondering if y'all wanted to sort of talk about that aspect a little bit. So, you know, I, I think that one of the things we try to do here and indeed, you know, our chapters are very good at um, is looking at the individual as a whole person. So if you are going to, you know, when we work with a candidate with a uh, disability that was sourced by one of our chapters, we look at that individual, not just as a job seeker, but what are they doing, you know, outside of the workplace? How do they get to work, you know? What, what is their preferred schedule? Because I mean, not everybody works on the same schedule. And people without disabilities, not everybody works on the same schedule. So you have to, you know, I think this is another misconception is that like, you know, we're not just, you know, putting a cog into a machine. This is a, this is an individual. And so there will be, uh, they have, they'll, they'll have some issues at home certain days. or like, they'll have some medications that they have to take. And they'll have some behaviors that may need addressing. But, you know, and again, our chapters are really wonderful at not just providing, you know, pre-employment training and, you know, the soft skills and hard skills they need in the workplace, but they also, you know, provide uh, uh, social interactions and, so, and socialization skills so that, you know, uh, individual, so that they can, you know, first recognize if there are any kind of problematic behaviors that might affect their, you know, lives in the future, um, uh, recognize them and address them. But beyond that, like, you know, the, the ARC is always here. Um, the ARC is in, you know, virtually every community in America and, you know, we are here as a resource, even if we weren't necessarily the provider that supported, a, you know, a, a corporation hiring an individual, we can be there to support that individual or at, at the very least be a consultation to that, uh, to that uh, corporate client. Um, you know, so that's, that's kind of my piece. I don't know if you had anything to add. No, no. I think you did a great job of summing it up and I, you know, what I hear from employers is they come to us seeking to fill roles. Is that you know some of the things that you mentioned, and we and we we hear that 
our issues are not just um, confined to the disability community. So right. there's right. a lot of jobs that uh, people, neurotypical people, people without disabilities aren't getting to work on time, not communicating with their bosses, um, may suffer from a mental illness, may you know have uh, other issues going on in the home place that are affecting their work. And you know, one thing we try to do is not isolate that as a disability issue, but as a uh, just a HR issue that you know how can we solve it because we have expertise serving this particular population. Yeah, I agree. And and you really have already answered this question that I want to ask you, but you really sort of answered it just then. But I just want to say those services are invaluable to employers. I, I don't care what size employer you are. I, I often, you know, I talk a lot to corporations and and they'll say, well, but what happens if, and it's like you were saying, what, I mean, that could happen to any of us. You know, when my daughter was sick, she was deathly sick for three months and my my work suffered, you know, I, I did, my work definitely suffered. And it was because I was really putting so much of my attention on my daughter, which was appropriate, but still, you know, I still had work. So apart from working with companies to hire, you know, individuals with disabilities, what are some other ways like this that the ARC at Work um, drives inclusion and really supports employers? And I'm saying corporations because they work with a lot of large national and local and state organizations, I mean, corporations, but they really work with all employers. So, you know, they're if, if you want to employ people with intellectual developmental disabilities, they want you to do that. And they want to bring in their resources and their chapters and make it be a good fit and a win for you and, of course, the individuals. So tell us more about what you do. Yeah, uh, so um, one of the things we're involved in right now and we've been involved with in the past couple of years is a research project with uh, UMass Boston. Um, and it's a research project on how essentially to support um, disability services agencies like our chapters to become, um, uh, you know, to change their the way they think about employment from, you know, providing really just kind of um, siloed and very, um, how do I say, uh, employing people internally um, to really be outward facing and working with, you know, partners in the community, working with corporate clients to place people into jobs. And, you know, we, along with the ICI research team was fabulous. It's, I mean, their expertise is, you know, through the roof. But, you know, with them, we've supported 10 of our chapters to kind of develop a strategic plan to really, I mean, and Deborah, I have to say, anybody who knows anything about disability services, this is a seismic shift. This is a completely like different model, different way of doing things than before. And we've worked with, you know, so these 10, you know, our 10 chapters and affiliates over the past um, a couple of years to really kind of identify the, you know, uh, um, strategies and, and develop plans to make this seismic shift. And so now, like, you know, these, you know, uh, these 10 chapters are much better able to kind of um, uh, like connect with uh, uh, employers in the community and better serve them ultimately, you know, and, and, and help their in the individuals that they serve actually get out into the community and get employed. Um, so that's just one way. Yeah, and I think, you know, Stefan speaks to um, one of the most important aspects of our work is look at systems change and understand where internally, you know, sort of the behind the scene of, you know, like a website, you might see what's on the screen, but behind the scenes, people are working on, on the bells and whistles to make sure it runs properly. And so one of the things that I do, I have the fortune, uh, the fortune of being the chair of the State Rehabilitation Council here in D.C., and so, you know, as a commissioner, mayor appointed position, I have some influence on how vocational rehabilitation um, is run in the state, how RSA is run. And there are, you know, things that I try to help improve on a systems level. Um, introduction of technology into how we serve people and, and how we pay for that technology. Uh, understanding caseloads at the state level and how we can better serve constituents, um, in this case in DC how we approach employers and understand what the, the economy is here locally and what employers are looking for and how we all speak, not just the ARC, not just my local chapter I oversee, but how the state speaks to, to businesses, how other nonprofits speak to businesses. So we're all on the same page. And then how do we all work together to problem solve and ensure that there's no turf wars? You know, it's, it's about getting the right person the right job. And it's not about the ARC necessarily doing it or 
XYZ company doing it or the state doing it, but all of us doing it together. And you know, that has now extrapolated over the course, you know, last year to my work in Egypt, where, you know, I'm going in front of head of ministries of, of, of you know, federal ministries over there and saying, like, here's some approaches you can take to work with employers. Here's some legislation you need to pass um, to make um, the job easier, as much like you probably told them, to, to make businesses uh, more acceptable and make it easier for business to bring people on. And, um, you know, have that mentality all the way up through their parliament. So they're seeing that there's a percentage of their constituents out there that um, are being underutilized. And, you know, we do that in Egypt, we do that here in the States, and we do that um, at the national level, state level, and local level. And we're trying to, you know, create systems change in order to really make an efficient, effective process for people. Which is one reason why I really wanted to have you on the program, because I just think that employers don't understand what has happened. You know, how much y'all have learned, how much you have contributed, how much you are, um, you know, really engaged in these conversations from so many different aspects. And I thought my audience would really, really like to hear this as well. I sometimes a corporation, when I start dealing with a large multinational corporation, they'll say, well, what we can do, Deborah, is we, and to be honest, I haven't heard them say this in a, in a couple of years. It used to be a very common question that I would get, but they would say, well, we can call out these particular jobs just for people with disabilities. Is that okay? We'll, we'll, you know, the mail room that, you know, and I would say, no, stop. We don't want you calling out jobs for us. We're not going to ask you to create jobs for us because that's not fair either. We want the, if you have a job opening, we would like the opportunity to, you know, bring candidates to you that have disabilities that might meet those jobs. And people with disabilities, including people with intellectual disabilities, they it's a spectrum. It's a spectrum. So you can't assume that every single person with a disability, an intellectual disability, is just like my daughter, Sarah Rue, or just like anybody else. It's a spectrum. But often, there is, there is a lot of misinformation when it comes to hiring people with intellectual disabilities. And I recently have been watching the controversy that's happening at Walmart. Walmart has made a business decision to get rid of the greeters. And that unfortunately is impacting a lot of people with intellectual disabilities that the customers love, the individuals love their jobs. And I've joined some of the conversations about ju just showing the stories, but that's another reason why we don't want you to just create a, these little jobs over here and they're just for people with IDD. Instead, we want you to, you know, we want you to let us bring in these really talented individuals and let them apply for jobs that they're qualified to do and that they're actually interested in doing. Because as you said, Stefan, they're people. And everybody has different, you know, different loves and different, um, you know, we, we always do better when we get to do work that we love. And the three of us are really blessed to do work we love. But so let me ask you if there was one key insight to offer to both public and private sector employees that, you know, you could offer to employers to really help them improve their disability hiring practices. And I'm not going to limit you to just one, but we've talked about some of it already. We've talked about how you will create a program. And I liked what you were saying. You will create a pilot program that you can be successful at and then build upon the successes. Good. <laughs> you will help them with accommodations and assistive technology. You'll pull in your partners with that. It is not just the, okay, here's your hire, we're gone. No, it's about, you know, what if there's a bump in the road, which there are bumps in roads, you know, it's part of being alive. You know, you can come in and help regardless of whether you place those individuals or not. I thought that was an interesting point, but any other advice? Yeah, I think it comes down to, you know, two, two words, purposeful and commitment. So if you want to be successful in anything, you have to be purposeful in what you're trying to do and you have to be committed to the idea that you're trying to implement. And that's no different uh, whether it's an individual or a Fortune 500 company. And I think what we've seen, Stefan's seen in our work is the companies who are uh, committed to the idea of hiring people with disabilities and have a purposeful um, plan in place to do that, they're ultimately successful. And I think that begins with um, culture change sometimes 
But this has to be something that is implemented, but also accepted at all levels of organization from um, the, the uh, senior management suite down through HR to the frontline managers to all, all the staff. And when they do um, have that commitment and buy in, we do see 60% of the companies we work with have seen a cult, positive cultural change happen. So what happens is they see people with disabilities working hard, being successful, then everybody wants to work hard and be successful. And ultimately, um, you know, businesses who succeed at this increase their uh, return on investment. We had 100% of people, uh, companies who we work with said that um, they have seen an increase in productivity in the workforce when they hired people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. You think that was a mistake? You think it was just a chance happening? No. Um, right. There's a reason, um, a good solid business reason for hiring people who want to work and want to do the jobs well. And uh, so, you know, it comes down to, again, commitment, being purposeful, um, and, and doing it at the end of the day, make it happen. And you know what's interesting about the comment that you made, just made, because I totally agree with you. Um, we're we're blowing everything up anyway when it comes to everything everything we're doing all over the world. And so we, as women, are saying, no, 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 no. We're tired of, you know, this gender pay gap and the gender equality issues. We're tired of it. And we're tired of losing $531 billion every single year through the, this gender pay gap. Um, and so there is a lot happening. The younger people are saying, no, this is ridiculous. Why would we not include everybody? So I am talking a lot about the UN Sustainable Development Goals and of the 17 UN SDGs, 11 of them touch people with disabilities. And so, and the younger people have made it very clear to employers, they're not going to work with you if you not are not a purposeful company, you know, planet profit people. We, we are not, we don't begrudge you making a profit, but if that's your only goal, then, you know, a lot of very talented uh, people, especially younger people are saying, well, we're just not gonna work with you. You see, you know, large numbers of people walking out um, whenever the, the executives are not dealing with sexual, you know, misconduct and things like that. So the world is shifting and a, a lot of corporate brands listen to the program and they understand that if they are not including a diverse workforce, then you're missing out. And Jonathan mentioned that they, you know, they're hearing from all of the corporations they're working with that it's improving their bottom line. But it's not just people saying, oh yeah, it's improving our bottom line. We have the numbers. I know that I've written multiple books on this topic, including a book with uh, G3ICT, mentioning them again on the employment of people with disabilities. I always have them obnoxiously behind my head. <laughs> Product placement. But um <laughs> But when I when I wrote uh, this one uh, with G3 ICT, uh, tapping into hidden human capital, I um, talked about Canon in that one. And Canon had hired um, about 20 people with intellectual disabilities. And they were shocked when across the board, their productivity in this one particular plant outside, it's in Naperville, um, outside Chicago, that the, the productivity went up like 36% for everybody. And they're like, whoa, why, what is going on over there that that productivity would go up so much? Well, turns out when Americans, since this was an American, you know, situation, when Americans are proud and happy, they're more productive. They, they, they interviewed different people and they said, I feel really proud to be able to sit down and have lunch with John who has Down syndrome and Sally who has autism and these are Canon employees and and I just feel really proud that I'm part of this. I feel like I'm part of making a difference in the world. And that translated to a more productive, um, you know, organization all the way across the board. So we're not just saying this as a nice to have. We know this. We have these numbers. Jonathan, I don't know if you or Stefan want to comment on that. Is that my book back? Okay. Um, you know, by, by and large, um, I mean, I, I think... I think it's definitely everything that you just said and what Jonathan has said is, uh, rings rings very true to me as well. And I hope I hope uh, you know the corporate brands that are listening um, all you know also start to kind of think about these uh, these points as well. Um, but you know what one one comment that I'd like to add, um, which is you know related to this, but otherwise is you know the fact is 
disability services organizations and the supports to you know to even start or bolster a current initiative um, are are everywhere in the community. And so, if you're as part of being purposeful in this process, you need to be able to identify the right community partners. And it could be that you know if, if there if there's an arc close by, for example, an arc chapter. Absolutely go to them, see what's going on. But there are plenty of other wonderful providers out there that do terrific work. And it's a, it's really about engaging the people in your community and getting the community involved. Um, because you'll, you know, people will be surprised. People will be surprised um, how how dedicated and how professional and and mostly how like how hungry people are to have that kind of interaction with with uh, with corporations. And so, you know, um, I and it's the other thing is. If there are listeners out there who are um, who are concerned that oh you know we should definitely we should definitely do more, it's not too late. You know, it's not it's not too late to start. Um, even if it's baby steps, as we were saying earlier, it's really just kind of about building up. It's it's about momentum, and it's it's. I'm not going to say that the whole uh, the whole process of creating an inclusive work workspace and and um, employing somebody or several people with disabilities. I'm not going to say it's all roses and it's going to be super easy. But at the same time, you know, again, it's all about getting the right supports, being purposeful, and being committed. And if you have if you have those three elements, really, um, you're you're in really good shape to make it happen. Yep, and, and we all expect it. And then you got to talk about it and tell us what you're doing, so we can reward you by giving you our business. So, on that note, tell the audience how they can find out more about your work. Go to our website. Um, <laughs> and the website is? Slash the arc at work. And we are excited. We're getting ready to launch a brand new website in, in the coming weeks. And it's uh, going to look very, very nice. It's going to have a lot of information about our success, success of the people we serve, and um, how businesses can connect with us. We also have a LinkedIn page. So the arc at work. You can look there coming months. And uh, give us a call. Email us. Um, and uh, let us know how we can help you. Yes, and I'll make sure that we put all the links out there so that you can find them, but um, we really appreciate the conversation today, Jonathan and Stefan. Thank you for coming back on the show again, and I'm really impressed with what you're doing, which is why I wanted to have you on air. I wanted to make sure everybody else realized that there's a lot going on, and you have partners that are willing to support you, so um, I look forward to continuing the conversation, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you.